Are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay. Call the select board to order. Are there any changes or additions to the agenda as presented? Seeing none. All right. I call the uh, trustees to order. Uh, Six oh two. You guys have any changes or additions to the uh, agenda tonight? No. 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 Um, no. We're all set. Perfect. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, I want to thank Donnie Riddle for coming to present. The, our first topic tonight is going to be the uh, hazard mitigation plan uh, and reviewing where we're at and what the steps for the future. I'm going to turn it over to Melanie or to our experts. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody, for having me tonight. Again, what you have in front of you is a few sections of the Johnson Hazard Mitigation Plan. Just wanted to get your feedback on these sections and then I can make any edits. The next part of this process is that it would go uh, for a public comment. So that would need to go to either a select board or a trustees meeting or a planning commission meeting. It can be any of those uh, to start off the public comment period. After that, I'll make any changes um, and edits to the plan, and that's when it goes to Vermont Emergency Management. They do the review for the FEMA approval. They usually send back some comments. We make changes, and then it can be um, formally adopted after that. So the first section, if you know, if there's anything you want to change or add on the 4.3 goals, projects, and activities. I just want to point out that this that this has informed a lot of our activities. This is relevant to the work we're doing with the Holmes Meadow as uh, a flood preservation area. Uh, we've used similar uh, priorities when we're talking about the viability of the light industrial park as being a way to expand our economic base outside of uh, our flood risk areas, making our community more economically resilient to future disasters um, and kind of keeping an eye on the impacts that also has on our infrastructure costs and our, our obligations in the future. So we're, we're off to a good start with this, but there's only room for improvement. So how long ago was it when you did this? It needs to be um, updated every five years. So it's going to expire, I believe maybe September. It's in the fall of this year. It was five years ago we did this? Yes. Wow. Every year they do the um, local emergency management plan. That's a very simple um, form. So if you kind of hear about that, that has to be done annually. I was like quicker than the older. It does. <laughs> I didn't believe it's six years of practice. So if there's no comments on the goals, projects, and activities, we can, you know, review the maps if there's anything that you want changed. Uh, they have been updated in terms of like the critical facilities. Um, Alec Jones, who is our um, GIS specialist, updated the maps. So if there's anything you see that needs to be changed, let us know. This talks about electrical outages. This is Beth Boy. This talks about electrical outages. Um, and we have our CD for high speed internet, you know, beginning to function. How does that, all of this project work and impact them in any way, or do they impact what you're planning? Under which section are you talking about? Well, when I look at the um, Sorry, I don't have page numbers. After the table of town and village mitigation actions, there's a oh, table five. It says mitigation action status table. I just happened to notice that there was one about infrastructure and avoiding long term electric outages. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're talking about electric outages, in theory, we're also talking about internet outages. 
So I don't, I don't know if there's a correlation. I guess that's my question. That's something that we could definitely add. It obviously, you know, it's not specifically addressed, but also there are several people who get phone through internet and, you know, generally communicate that way. So if you wanted that added, we could definitely add it. I don't know, Brian. I mean, it would be someone new. We didn't have, we didn't have it before. I think it's definitely something that, uh, you know, but uh, most, not everybody, but most internet access will come with a telephone mobile. So, anything affecting going to your telephone mobile is going to affect the internet. Like somebody said, the one who the phone link to the same resource. It, uh, I think it's a good, good idea to include for, you know, future awareness. And then, you know, sorry, just to build off, off of that a little bit. When we're talking about wind damage and infrastructure, it also impacts cell towers and, and cell reception. And we all know we can't live with, without both cell reception and Wi Fi. So, yeah. you know, how does that play into this, too? Yeah. Uh, I have one comment on the maps. Mm -hmm. uh, under transportation concerns, uh, and maybe it's a little, maybe it's just enough happening now that it's a little bit hard to read. But on what would be Route 15, um, kind of heading east of town, uh, we've got that area across the NATO's pit and a little bit east of the NATO's that has quite a bit of erosion. That the state's doing some work to try and mitigate, but that has been a perennial area of high erosion. So okay. Route 15, kind of in between Collins and Collins Hill and Maple Hill, kind of closer to Maple Hill, but not all the way over. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to see that marked as a high erosion. Okay. I wrote the erosion first. Uh. All right. But make sure you put responsible parties the state AOT. <laughs> yeah, they're working on it. Yeah, they are making significant improvements there, and we really appreciate that. But. It's so important to remember that that does remain a high risk. Mm -hmm. What makes it a high risk? I was, I'm thinking high risk because of the the rate of change that I've seen the erosion there over the last few years. That in the last five or six years, they have made. Uh, a couple projects over there to repair the bank, and they've had to come back several times. So they've had two or three mitigation projects over there just in the last five or six years. So, is that higher erosion alone, or is that higher erosion with an impact of public safety or transportation? It's specifically impact of transportation. I, I think it's a, a potential impact of transportation because uh, we noticed. Like, or it seems like a high amount of accidents in that area. Yeah. And it, it seems like the, we've questioned, we've sent questions to the state about just a perception of the road and the way it does some roles or mm -hmm. you like, Yeah. Yeah. Just, there's something going on there. I don't have a clue how much they spend on any of that. Bank, but I was thought that they would have tried to have made some kind of an arrangement with NATO and buy a little piece of that corner and straighten that road out. I think that would make a lot more sense to me. Well, they also did that pinning on 100C and it's failed to work. Our roads dropped and cracked and they resealed it, repaved it within what twice in five years. Yeah. All right, before the, the powerhouse bridge, oh, okay. right on the corner. Mm -hmm. right yeah. 
Yeah, I'm not sure what the official criteria are, but that's an area of personal concern. Unfortunately, when they get hung up on something, it's typically a better how long it is. Yeah. Um, the other thing, Brian, I asked about the impact of transportation because I know that actually behind BJ's house, I know that behind Railroad Street properties, there's high erosion there. There's not necessarily an impact of transportation, but it is an impact of property value and potential flood risk. Yeah, we lost 10 feet last year from the river. Do it in your backyard. We don't lose it, it's more of a sweat. <laughs> you still pay taxes on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that's a, and that was just now. We actually had Tatro's come this summer and put in a rock wall. Don't tell or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> we're right. we're so, well, my point yeah. is that that's a high, that is a, uh, if, we, if it is about erosion, that is a high erosion location. If maybe that impacts so, the flood hazard map, I'm not really sure. Do you want to talk about erosion? Go on the church. Can you answer that question? I'm not really sure either. We should do something like that. I will double check, but I would assume it would be more like the flood hazard map. Okay. Um, you know, again, it doesn't sound like it's as much, right? That's affecting like the roadway, but it's affecting the properties there. Yes. And that is an area where we're likely, if we have flooding, we're likely to see it in that area. You know, the only the only area I'm aware of is behind United Church and Johnson. I know that one of the uh, one of the service poles, uh, power poles out there is, and it's being encroached upon to a point where I'm assuming this this spring they'll have to do something about it. So there's an area where the river has changed significantly, more than ten feet. And uh, right now, once it once it makes its cut across that back peninsula by there, the river is going to be more straight towards that pole, and then I'll, that will survive. Yeah, so that is, I think both of those areas are covered. You know, I can't really zoom in on the map, but it looks like both of those areas are covered, but it's worth a review to make sure that we're getting, you know, that area in between Route 15 and the Guion behind the United Church and in between Railroad Street and the Guion also. Yeah, I'll see about adding erosion to the flood map because it it's obviously not on there, but if that's an area and what you would like to see, then <clears throat> and anything on the actions or the action status. I know we talked a little bit about that or the evaluation and prioritization matrix. I also wanted to see if the village had anything that they wanted to add. Um, I think there's only two because you uh, completed one from the last hazard mitigation plan. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, you know, I can't think of anything specifically you know, other than um, the stormwater um, you know, infrastructure, which we have um, responsibility for. Um, a lot of the other things that are more focused on the roads is more town centric. Um, so I can't think of anything else that immediately comes to mind that would be a mitigation action um, that the village would uh, participate in. Um, but I, I will think about it a little bit more. If anything comes to mind, I'll certainly let you know. Um, and as you mentioned, we did update those um, loan guidelines like we discussed for a revolving loan fund to include um, flood proofing of buildings. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and that's fine. It's not like I just wanted to check. So yeah, if there is anything that comes up, send it, send it on. Uh, one thing I've seen on table six, uh, it lives in the town of Mountain Highway Department, and we changed the name of the department to Town of Mountain Public Works. Okay. 
I'll make sure that's also, if it's anywhere else in the plan, I'll change that. Appreciate you including the scale of what low, medium, and high cost is. Yep. Too many that we read that the very arbitrary is what we think is higher low cost. That is true. Would it be appropriate to move in table five? Would it be appropriate to, to move the upgrade bin on the culvert side of the town highway road bridge standards to an ongoing activity? Uh, technically, that's a finite activity. We will someday finish that, but it's It's going to be a long time coming before we're actually finished with that. And yeah, it's a part to really envision what that looks like when it's done because there's so many things that, you know, by the time we upgrade them to one standard, they change the standard. The, the, the standard could change, the water patterns could change. Like, yeah, technically, there's a finite number of culverts and we could someday upgrade all of them. But, I would love to see us then starting back over at the beginning and yeah, upgrading and repairing all over again. Yeah, I can move that. If we're uh, talking about table five, I just have a slight rewording um, under um, actions rewarded included in the 2022 plan, the uh, last one. It says develop a plan with the transmission service provider to upgrade the existing infrastructure and avoid long-term electric outages. Um, now, I don't really see us developing a formal plan with them. I think it would be more accurate to say, you know, work cooperatively with the transmission service provider um, on maintenance and upgrades of the existing infrastructure. Um, I just, I don't see, we're not going to be able to dictate <laughs> to develop a plan because that's, you know, not are in some cases it's not infrastructure that we have ownership interest of some we do but it's more of working cooperatively versus sort of directing a plan that would require them to do things okay i can make that change i checked with our planning commission and with megan in your office not only, but i think the ground crew thing is very important May have been completed. I'll double check. Yeah, I think that there were sections that hadn't been, but I will double check. I'm not sure what the status on that is. So, oh, sorry. Are we okay on tables five and six? Looking at the uh, prioritization matrix. Okay. 
has a lot of changes with us. I'm looking for you. Under uh, halfway down there, uh, proprietary, proprietary matrix, uh, manage ash trees. The, D, the very first column responds to significant, likely a high risk hazard. Would that be increased now? How do we know the ash borer is very local? I can see changing that to a four. I mean, it's been located, I forget where, but. Belvedere. Belvedere, yeah, I was going to say it's a wild county, so. Our next door neighbor. It's yeah. probably here. Uh, yeah, and if there are some in Belvedere, it's, I would be amazed if it's not here. And if it's not here now, it will be very soon. So, what did you suggest on that one, Erica? Five? Yeah, I mean something higher than a three. Yeah. Yes. Four or five. I don't know if it needs to be mentioned here, but this this talks about um, managing in accordance with state recommendations. But we also have a town uh, plan for management of the EAD. We could possibly mention that here. I think it probably gives more detail. Might be a little more. Specific to Johnson, that plan. I think that's a good idea. It also also credits us with some of the work we've already done on that front. Did you want me to include both the state and, or just your plan? I, I think the state. I mean, if the state has new information, I think we'd like to know. Mm -hmm. But we do have our current plan that we would chiefly be following. Okay. Last one on that page, uh, maintain the PPE for current future health events. With us being in the COVID world we are, would that change some of our thought process across that? Or as far as be... Well, the likelihood of funding is probably a five, right? Yeah, that's a five. Easy one. Yeah. Uh, protect threatened infrastructure. I mean, infrastructure is the workforce. And is the workforce infrastructure? I, did, I think of infrastructure as a built infrastructure, which having adequate PPE does protect that because we do need our employees in order to maintain the built infrastructure. Or do we consider the employees themselves? I don't know. Any suggestions on it? Uh, well, it does seem like it would be protecting the actual infrastructure, which for this would be the employees. Okay. Yeah, I think if it's if we're talking about infrastructure as employees, I think popping that from a three makes a lot of sense. Maybe the first three columns should all be fives. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Uh, Politically acceptable, that's probably higher now. Feasible. Actually, technically feasible might go down with the supply problems we're having. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. New PPE that we're trying to get would be with the rapid test, which we can't currently get. Efforts. Well, they haven't gotten off the boat from China yet. But in a five year plan, I mean, in a five year plan, I think. Yeah, you might have so a question of six month. Yeah, this one should be a year, but 
feasible. Just depends what kind of one. I guess there's another one question for you, Molly. What 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 time span should we be evaluating this on? Like, well, we have this as listed from 2022 to 2027. So, Perfect. and let we can also change that. Um, but that was kind of the because this would be ongoing. That yeah. was the time frame. But I, I think I do like a four. If we're talking about a five year time frame. Okay, so at this point, I have changing the first three columns to a five and keeping the technically feasible at a four. I think we just we we're going to improve the socially and politically acceptable as well. So I go to four or five. I got four. Four. Melanie, do we formally adopt these changes or is this just a review? This is just a review at this time. So it comes back for adoption after the FEMA review. Okay. And after the public, so public comment period will be next and then goes to FEMA for review. Okay. And after we get um, pending approval, uh, it can come for adoption. Well, good. Yeah. Good. Like, like more. That's also, yeah. Yeah. I am. Yeah. I am. But these are all good. You have anything, anything else, Mallory? Um, just if anybody had a preference to being the meeting that kicked off the public comment period. Uh, I can also connect with Brian, but if you, if anybody wanted it, that way I can work on the public warning. Does she mean the select board or the trustees? Uh, which board? Well, or the planning commission she mentioned at the beginning. She said typically yes. the planning commission or select board or village trustee to kick it off. If it, if it was the planning commission, they serve both the town and village. Right. Would that work as would one meeting work as two the hearing for both the government? Yes. And Again, this is a joint. It, it's confusing because it's it is a joint plan similar to your town plan. So I believe, and Brian also might know differently, but I believe it can be any meeting because it will be warned to the public, and anybody could attend. Yep, that's, that's my understanding. So does it make sense to send it to plain information? Sure. A lot of sense. A lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, not not here. Here. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, if there's nothing else, thank you, Melanie, for joining us. Thanks, all. Right. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah. Have a good night. I'll be in touch and I'll help you connect with all of us out the public comments. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up on our agenda is a discussion about the community and economic development coordinator position. So uh, we had a prior, I the most recent joint meeting with the meeting before that, there's been some discussion about possibly hiring. Uh, some kind of we didn't have a title for it at the time. Uh, I picked community and economic development coordinator because that was a title that we used for a position in the past that has similar functions. Uh, but 
uh, some kind of position to function as economic development, grant writing, planning, uh, and a few duties around that capacity. Um, and we're getting close to town and village meetings, so it makes a lot of sense for us to circle back and make sure we're on the same page, iron anything out that we need to discuss, and uh, try and move forward. So I'm going to keep this here because we decided to wait to make any decision on that so we can go our budget. So okay. we're, we're on a holding pattern. So you can move forward whatever you choose. We have to tonight make our warning. And what we've been incorporating in our warning for town meeting day, we're doing Australian ballot, by the way. We started yeah. the other night. Uh, there will be an article to ask voters for 40,000. And we left it sort of open. Um, it's worded as an economic community development and left out the word coordinator in case you guys you know, didn't come through or what mm -hmm. have you, that there would be that 40000 that maybe we could use in some other way, hiring a grant writer or what have you. But, uh, so we are going forward with it. Okay. But it is going to be a separate article to the voters. And like I shared with my board, I'm a little bit concerned with it being an Australian ballot. We will not have the opportunity to explain what our thoughts are and why we're doing it. That uh, you know, it may not pass. We'll, we'll find it. Well, let's see uh, the downside to where we're at. Yeah, for sure. But at the informational meetings, you'll bring it up and discuss it. Yep. Yeah. And hopefully we can convince all 30 people to show up. Yeah. <laughs> tell the rest. If, if that. Tell their people. If that. <laughs> Unfortunately, information. We've scheduled two information meetings, mm -hmm. but uh, they're typically not well attended. Yeah. Right. I'd say that's uncovered. And are you willing, if let's say it passes, and let's say we have, we get, somebody to write grants? Do we work together on some of the things that need to be done? Is Does your board want to do that kind of thing? I anticipate we would, but it will be a new board. I, I would say that, that yeah, this board plans on working with them. That looks good. Can't speak for the new one. I think Mike said it well, that I think we get a better bang for the buck by working together. I can't imagine any new board not wanting to work with the other trip. No. No, that would be great. That's one. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. Next on the agenda, I guess. Yeah. All right. Next up is the first. I'd like to speak up right off the get go. I, uh, my hat's off to this committee. This is a nice report. For, you consider this a start, right? It's an excellent start. There's a lot of good figures in here. Yeah, I guess it would be. Evan and Beth did all the work. Every <laughs> while, you talk about it. That's off the bat for a few okay. minutes. Do you want to, uh, <laughs> do you want to present it then? Uh, so these are our minutes. These are the minutes that are public minutes. These are, the yeah, these are the minutes that are public. That will be on the website whenever that's whenever possible. Back hey, the website's got a new look. Sorry, that's out of place, but. Thanks for cutting me off, Kyle. <laughs> I just woke up. Go ahead. <laughs> I got a button. Yeah. So, I got the easy and you don't care no more. Sorry, Evan. Uh, I'm just picking. Uh, so, the committee had decided uh, to go on factual numbers, and we were tasked with finding out what a yearly cost would be. So, to go by actual numbers, uh, we had to use the 2020 20, 20, 21. Oh, um, amount to be raised 
in revenue by taxes uh, for the town. Um, and because the village falls a different fiscal year, uh, we use the village's uh, tax revenue base. Um, and Meredith had provided input, and everybody wanted to know what it would look like if the full loss of state pilot um, for the college contribution was gone. So in figure one, uh, we list the town grant list, um, town tax revenue, village grant list, village tax revenue, and then the assumed tax revenue if there's no pilot money received um, for the state college. Um, and then it lists the sum of tax revenues between both towns. So, so a yearly cost impact uh, could be very easily figured by adding up the two budgets and assigning that to the town's mm -hmm. grand list. Uh, figure number two uh, shows what a sample tax bill for a town taxpayer would be um, for 2021, 2022 with no changes. Um, right. And figure three is the same for the village to get our baseline. Both are for primary residents. And it is important to note, um, however this was presented to the taxpayers is a little bit difficult. This is municipal tax bill. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that the school gets the lion's share of, yeah. of what everybody rates in the taxes. But if somebody were to look at this and say, I have a $100,000 house, so it seems like I pay a lot more than $826 in taxes. It's probably because you pay five times that in school tax. But, um, so figures two and three are unchanged. That's what a town tax resident, a village tax resident would get. Uh, figure four is what a tax bill would be if the two entities were merged together, the budgets were kept exactly as they were, and there was no pilot money received to the village's portion of the state. College. Um, so that's what a total town tax bill would be. Everybody in town would pay those rates. Um, figure five is what the impacts would start breaking down to. So for a tax resident under a merged municipality uh, with a hundred thousand dollar house would end up having a cost increase in that year in the past because these are actual numbers of seventy dollars and forty two cents. And these are all just broken down 100, 150, 200. Yep. I use the 100,000 because it's very easy to multiply in yeah. my head. But the percent was 8%, right? Uh, we'll get to that. Um, so that's the cost impact to every town resident. The cost impact to every village resident uh, for that year would be a total tax savings of $111.18. That's because they wouldn't have to pay the $181 to the village, but their town taxes would raise by $70. That's all really important when we talk about these numbers that we're talking about then for a primary resident because that, that's the town tax rate that's being used. So if they're if that's not your primary home, you're going to be taxed at a different tax rate. That's only school rate. Oh, that's only school, everybody else is just flat. Yep. Wow. Yeah, okay. municipal okay. taxes cool. are flat. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. And this is only municipal. That is very important. Well. It's, it's for the tax adjustment, that's why. Right, tax adjustment. This, this doesn't it could include be any like that, yes. set of tax adjustment or anything like that. So just be a tax bill. Uh, if you flip the page over on page six, uh, this is the figure that all the board members on the, the committee members really like. It lists everything out under a merged municipality line by line with percentages. So for somebody with a hundred thousand dollar house under a municipality, they would receive a tax bill of eight hundred and ninety six dollars. Town increase would be seventy dollars and forty two cents. Bill of Johnson residents would save one hundred and eleven dollars and eighteen cents, uh, which would come out with. And these numbers are calculated out to four places, but a town of Johnson. Resident would receive an 8% increase on their taxes. A village of Johnson resident would receive an 11% savings. Um, there is great notes all the way through the meeting minutes, and I would um, definitely recommend that everybody that has this report, and especially when it's online, uh, reads through it very closely. 
this is what the committee was tasked with was with coming up with a yearly cost of what a merged municipality would look like for tax payments. Perfect. And the school tax would change. School tax would be the same. Right. The town pays all that, right? The town pays all that, right? So, so there's no change in that. So it's no, there's no, there's nothing hidden there. So Correct. You guys, you got to give all the numbers. Yep. Um, and again, all of these numbers, all the way through, are used with the assumption that the village of Johnson would not receive the fifty thousand five hundred dollars that they received from the state for the college. That's a big assumption. Uh, I didn't hear back from Meredith on, did you talk to Waterbury? So I was promised um, that as soon as he's done with his budget information, which he will call me next week. <laughs> uh, as I think you know, it's bad time for towns with their budget development, um, but he knows we're hoping to talk to him. And I also spoke with Northfield, um, which is uh, applicable because they have an electric department um, and he's supposed to be sending me some information as well. So. Um, I'm sorry it wasn't available for tonight, but um, I am waiting to hear back directly from those two communities specifically. Thank you. So this would not include any one-time costs. Right. Um, right. This is just what a yearly tax bill would be if the municipalities heard. And Meredith did hear from Essex. Um, charter fees on actually changing a charter are Essex was expecting it to be about twenty thousand dollars, so it's not the two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar numbers that people are throwing around. But this does not account for any one thing. No so legal cost. Legal cost legal or cost for changing the charter. No other costs are in there except for what we have. So this is basically taking this, is taking the, the general budget of the village. Distributed General budget of the village, adding fifty thousand five hundred dollars because we're assuming that they would get no money from the college, and they're distributing it to the town. So the charter change that's, that includes all the applications and lawyers fees. And... Meredith could probably answer that a little bit better. Yep. Um, so I reached out to Essex. Uh, Primarily, we talked about they were a little bit a different case than a lot of the typical mergers, and it hasn't actually happened, um, but they have had recent history, so it was easier to get some cost information from them than some of the communities that have gone through charters, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, um, through mergers 10 to 15 years ago. Um, and so I asked specifically about one-time costs um, related to either development of a merger plan or the new charter, um, and uh, the unified manager they spoke to uh, indicated that the, both communities agreed to hire a third party attorney. They didn't want to use a village attorney or a town attorney out of concerns that there might be, you know, accusations of bias either way. And so they hired um, uh, somebody out of, uh, I think it's Dan Richardson, um, to be their attorney. And he spent just developing the new merge charter um, about a little over $10,000. Um, that ended up losing by 19 votes, so they never went from trying to actually move that new charter through the legislative process. Um, and he estimated that would have run, probably been five to ten thousand dollars more for that attorney to help bring it through the legislative committees um, and actually get it approved. Um, he did also indicate that there was a significant amount of staff time, uh, so you know that staff time cost. Obviously, we're paying staff anyway, so that's not. An additional cost, but uh, that's something to think about. That they did have to put a lot of effort in at the staff level in developing that charter as well. So it's more of a opportunity cost that they didn't have time to be doing other things. Um, and another reason to involve a third party attorney rather than the town or village is this particular ind individual has a lot of experience with developing municipal charters and knows what is or isn't likely to. To sort of pass the test of the legislature. The legislature tends to not like to see really odd, unique things. And so he was a good way to say, you know, this is, if you do it this way, you're likely to get approval of your, your new charter. Um, but so all told, he estimated it would have been about $20,000 just for that charter piece. Uh, other elements I know in the process are the development of a merger plan. I think that usually comes first and is sort of brought to the voters. Uh, and I could see, um, getting 
external help with that potentially from an attorney um, in order to make sure you're capturing all the things that you would want to put in a, a plan. Um, and I will hopefully get some feedback from Waterbury and Northfield on that specific topic. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, first of all, I, I think you guys did a wonderful, a tremendous job here. The apples to apples comparison, that's exactly what the voters would want to look for, I think. And you did the worst case scenario without the pilot money. Uh, maybe, Meredith, a question for you on the, uh, the charter. Now, the town doesn't have a charter, so you can't just have a charter uh, go away, or, or do we have to have a, a new charter of some sort? So my understanding is there would be a new charter that um, you know, would probably take elements of the village's charter, which is not a typical charter, but it's language that's been approved over the years, um, and codify that and then add in um, you know, more specific ta typical town charter language and mesh them together in a, a, a way that would be agreeable to the legislature. So I, I do think we would create something new. Um, and sort of more more formal than what we've had, uh, especially creating a new sort of municipality. Uh, I think that would be important to do. Did that answer your question, Eric? Yeah, I guess. It's sounding like we would have to have some kind of a charge. Yes. Yes. But there's always a chance that it could be, could be turned down by the legislature, correct? That is correct. Uh, uh, you know, I think if you don't have anything. To oddball in it, um, and that you know the communities have supported it, and you do some, um, you know, legislative work in talking to them and educating the legislators and committees about what your the goals and why you did it. You know, I, there is work to be done in order to get it approved and make everybody comfortable with it. I said it's highly unlikely that they would turn it down. This all of this work was done in fifty nine minutes. All these tables and everything was well, all put together. I think I think I would have set the task and you went did it later, right? Well, I brought the tables and the, we cleared every single line by line. Right. right. It's very simple math, actually. Right, but um, it's short of amazing how all this work that was accomplished in that meeting really. Yeah, the confusing part is when we start adding all these other things to it. I think that's where it's gonna get like if we we're talking about all these uh, court fees and everything if we put it into a loan for five years. So then we'd have to put the taxpayer, your first five years, these are gonna be your rates. And then after that, then this will be your rates. But that's where we weren't passionate about that yet. It's too bad with the $10,000 that we spent on the study. We could have spent a little time and had all these facts and figures in that study. I was thinking of though. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that was coming. I'll make a motion to tell you. <laughs> you, you, you wish in one hand, crap is good. <laughs> one of them will fill up. Yeah. So, yeah. I call the same. You know, set a task and you guys met it with the uh, flying colors. Um, so, where do you go from here? Um, my thought would be to move to the the extras we don't have numbers on. We got the one where the charter changes, 20,000 lawyers fees, and what other fees, what other costs, what other things like that to be able to, I mean, obviously, this is a standalone document, which you guys have done. We'll have, we'll have to throw in other figures, whether they're estimates or, or whatever, um, in there to be able to set another another chart to show what, you know, if, if it is feasible to get a loan for five years to take to do this, you know, what, how that would impact the, uh, both the village and the town that right, rate ratepayers. Um, that would be my suggestion. So I think that it would be important as the next step to pick another meeting date to discuss this um, jointly. And the voters, Tasked us with continuing the conversation. At one point, um, and it can't be in this year's uh, warning, I believe that the select board at the time owes it to the town taxpayers for them to approve a yearly expenditure increase of approximately 
and I believe that the village holds it to the holders that they would see a yearly cost savings of approximately 11%. That way we can bring it to the holders and say, I think we should still talk about this and try to come up with those one time expenses. But we owe it again to the voters to understand that as town residents are going to be paying approximately 8% more year over year, the village residents are going to be paying approximately 11% less year over year. But doing it that way, we're not giving them the correct figures because we haven't added everything else in. Well, one time expenses can be done out in a loan. Yeah, but then, then, then you're talking about a five, 10 year loan where are we going to do it in one year and pay 90 grand, whatever it ends up being? Are we going to put it in a loan to the taxpayer and it's going to be five years we're going to be paying this? Mm -hmm. just, they're still paying it, whether it's one year, five years, 10 years. I mean, it's just right, but the figures still, will be different. It, exactly. There's somebody in their pocket. Um, I just want to go to, if we're going to go that route, I'd like to go with it complete instead of them looking at this being like, okay, if we do this, we're going to save 11% as a, as a village where that's inaccurate. If it was only those figures, yes. But since we do have this other realm of figures going on, it's actually inaccurate. The other realm of figures is pretty small right now. Um, but it changes. It, I agree it does change. Um, I mean, the village has a, a good timing uh, to put it in their warning. Maybe the village voters want to vote for a reserve fund because to put $5,000 in this year uh, to potentially pay for merger costs. And then it can't be in our warning, but next year maybe we could put it to the voters to see if they want to put $10,000 in their fund and we can catch up with it. The six months off is a little difficult, yeah. uh, but the village does have the opportunity to do that. In I, which case, town could catch up. If there's general consensus that that's somewhat of a good idea, that nah, you're not going to be on the board next year. <laughs> it's a possibility. It's not. I, I, that's not out the realm of possibilities. I, for me personally, I'd like to see. I'd like to see some more real numbers. I mean, these numbers are real. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not deflating the, the validity of these numbers. Um, but as far as the the additional costs and stuff like that, I would not be comfortable putting out numbers to our to our voters at this time to uh, without having some other numbers, without having the, the actual cost of the actual process. If I mean we got time, so if, if those numbers come in, then I'd, I'd definitely bring it to my board about bringing it to the to the voters as far as you know information wise. You can um, only drag your feet so long, you know. Really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let, let me finish. Uh, this, these fi figures are excellent. Uh, you know, as I said before, when I was a trustee, <clears throat> we mulled this over numerous times and we did cursory calculations and everything else. And we all came to the conclusion that it was going to be advantageous to the village and not the town. It's really great to see that there is 11% gain to the village and an 8% loss to the town. So if I still live in the village, it would be a no brainer to me to vote to merge if I was gonna save 11%. So this is eventually gonna come. And the quicker you get it done, the less time you're gonna spend muddling through the waters here. So I think you ought to get right on it, get this squared away, bring the information to the voters and let them decide. I mean, we could bring these figures to the village people and tell them that there are going to be other costs. Explain that to them mm -hmm. and put it out there. Why not? And say that the discussion is going to continue, not just with money, but for a whole bunch of other stuff that we need to discuss. And you put it out there for them to, to read or they come to the informational meetings. But put it out there because we do have a whole bunch of other stuff to discuss. But this is not the whole picture. The union contract and buying out the employees is another feature that needs to be put in here somewhere. But, so I don't know how that's going to be put you know, in. And the, the, the notion that that contract is, is up for renewal when it's just going to go away, it's up for renewal. It was not, there isn't any agreement upon the new contract. That contract stands until a new contract is formed. So, exactly. so, that, so that's, that, that's not going to go away. Um, 
Those figures need to be added in. Right. Uh, into the whole thing. But I also think that we need to look at the utility uh, department and um, not have that be something that holds us back and look at options. It's not, holding, is, us, it's not holding us back. We just have to add it in. If, well, that's a pretty yeah, hefty yeah, thing to keep in there. It is, but we can't yeah. do nothing about that. Well, you can when you negotiate. Oh, so that's I'm in a union with Paraga with my other company, and then a company came up to us and said, "Hey, we're going to take this away from you guys." We'd say no, and would have to agree to it. They're not going to. The workers aren't going to agree to have that taken away from them. The company cannot just take that away from them. And, that, and that's just a small portion of the yeah, they will, they will it's, it, it's, so it's definitely information to put out there. I, I agree, Mike. We need to be. We need to continue moving forward, and that's what tonight and other nights are, are about. Um, so am I ready to personally to commit to putting it on before the voters this year? I need I need more numbers for me for me personally, but we're a board of five. So, so we're going to do this. What if we all went away? We sit on our joint meeting and we agree that we bring additional numbers we need to consider to the table. Because I already know that everybody here is having talks with somebody outside of this meeting, right? You know, at some point in the next 30 days and in the past 30 days, and cost is being discussed. So what are those things that are being brought up? And let's lay it all out on the table, put it in notes, and we can start to get some numbers around it. That's we already asked good. Meredith to go and do some homework um, from the village side. That's awesome. We'll look for those numbers from her. It sounds like we'll have some more information next week. Um, and in the meantime, we can get that inventory of things we need to consider. Focus purely on cost. Exactly. The inventory would be getting back to the list of items, right? Or memorandum of agreement. No, I just meant list of assets. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh the inventory. You know, we talked about that in the last meeting. I think, uh, in addition to, to Ron's numbers, which are super important, we need to continue on that. Um, I'm really interested in how, what would be envisioned structurally. Um, what is the actual impact on the electric department? Um, does that continue on as its own sort of independent utility? Because it's not a town-wide utility. There are plenty of people in town that don't get the bill utility. They're on co-op. So this is a question. Um, and certainly um, water and sewer is a very uh, limited portion of the population is receiving that service. So, what? How do those util? How are those utilities managed going forward under a like for structure? And um, there was another question. I had. Oh, so and, and also maybe there's been some discussion. What what happens with the board? Presumably, presumably there's some sort of utility board. We did. Well, that's that's the other thing is that you know if the town takes over everything, then they would become the trustees of the water, sewer, and electric. Mm -hmm. But it's not the town. No, both boards. Both boards would be the same. Right, right, right. The yeah. same. The new board would then be, now then be the trustees of water, sewer, and electric. You could have water and light commissioners. But we could have. You could. The so, uniqueness about that. I guess. I guess my my point is, and yeah, we, we can go into the ins and outs. You have commissioners. You have a subject. So how do you do this? The select board responsible for it. We're not going to solve that tonight, but if that's something that I think before we get too much further onto it, we'd have to start, start envisioning what that structure would be. And I think to, to that point, it's oh, too late for us anyway. And I don't think that they would be anywhere near close for you guys to be prepared to go to your voters yet. And I think that it'll be a big enough of a question that that will be a special town and village meeting when we just roll everything out. And that's when we would have an article on, you know, uh, probably a few articles, one for merging, one for uh, uh, putting so much money aside to, for the uh, lawyer field, field uh, fees and everything else. But I think that's down the road. Um, you know, like Mike said, this has been going on for however many years, 30 years, except for I've never seen it get this far. Yeah. And we're doing exactly now what the voters asked us to do. All right. Wait, 
in particular on that point, what I was saying, I'm really interested in what happens with the electric utility. And I think most people in the community would be beyond just raw thoughts because when you bring up ideas, you know, certain people will say, well, the electric utility doesn't exist without, uh, without sidewalks and, and uh, other infrastructure. I don't know if that's true or not. I've never I'm not in that world. Like, thank, thank you for dealing with it because I need to rather not that. But the, is that true? Does the electric then do you go back to some sort of arrangement where the you're contracting with another community or co-op or something? I don't that's I think that's a big question for voters beyond just costs. Mm -hmm. uh, that if it, it, it actually changes the structure, the actual our actual electric utility in a really substantial way, including our workers, which are a very interesting thing. Um, what's the impact? Because that really gets people pretty passionate. And some people are as passionate, you know, as about the water sewer as well. Concerns about if you know if a new board takes over and the board of the matrix is not users of the water and sewer, what's going to be their you know, I mean, I think everybody here has, has costs in mind for everything we do, but you know, there's always concerns about new boards. You know, if they're not using that utility, they go, well, let's just, just do this. It's just a rate increase of, we don't, you know, it doesn't impact them personally. You know, how does, you know, do they keep us tight as shit? Yeah, it's a passionate one. The great thing for rate payers is they're protected by the Vermont Public Utility Board. Electrics, so, yeah. So, um, so, I mean, I would say that sewer, and water is going to be protected pretty soon after a high power cold. Um, <laughs> but that's just me. Um, the unique portion is then actually all the ratepayers of utilities could have a say because right now they don't. But that's a long discussion. That's a different day. Walter Pomeroy spoke several years ago about wanting more customers for the wastewater treatment plant. I don't know what your reserve capacity is, but at the time it was tremendous. And so he wanted more customers for more revenue. And that way the revenue, the, the rates stay the same or they go down mm -hmm. if you get more customers. And so that is a plus. But the biggest sticking point I see in this whole thing is the buyout of the employees that they chose to go. And that never, ever should have been allowed to be put into that contract in the first place. Yeah. Well, we're still the barn now, I think. So we're, yes. we're left to deal with it. That's up to the village to negotiate. If they actively try not to remove that, they would be stalling for the next 10 years. Well, speaking of negotiation, I can't talk about it at the open meeting anyway. So there are actually a few different ways we can do this too. But maybe we have thought of this. One is the merge, which we're sort of talking that now. Uh, the other one is following the Waterbury example where the village just voted to not uh, disappear, uh, just dissolve. And then the town was left having to pick up all the pieces. Let's not do that. Yeah, I are gonna want to pay more, 8% more taxes. I but the I know, other I'm not crazy about it. Or there's another option of the Morrisville example where the village has all but virtually disappeared as a government and the village trustees are basically water and light commissioners. They yeah. just manage the utilities. Um, so you know, something like that is actually an option too. It's, it, would, it would still be a village government with nothing to do except for managing except the utilities. Yeah. So these become trustees of the utilities. Yeah. Which I think more people will be in favor of. You know? yeah. So and that would that, that wouldn't affect the the uh the buyout issue because it, it would change the trustees would remain the same. They just would lose all the all the infrastructure except for the utilities. Right. And we get back to the to the to buildings and stuff like that, and we just have to do a separation and then Electric department would own that. Does that include the fire department? I would say it would. As far as, I mean, it's not utility. It's not a utility. It's not a utility, no. So no, that so, would become so, part of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that would become part of the merger. Because it's sort of a family. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. 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 This utilities remaining separate would be a would be a cleaner break. I think. And of course, if that scenario was to play out, these cost figures, because the village government would go to the town, these cost figures would come in almost play. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. remember, these are one point one point. Yeah. 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 But but you use real numbers for a time period in, in time. Yeah. And uh, I mean, all you gotta do is change the change yeah. the uh, base the base rate, and then all the numbers propagate and become yeah. relevant. So that would be even up because they pass on a bigger increase to the town than into the village. Sure. So if you factor in those two, that would make a difference. No. Town pays more than village does. Yeah, but it wouldn't factor it wouldn't factor these numbers. These numbers are straight up offered. Yeah, these would be accurate. Yeah, like most of these. That that would make a difference too. Oh, oh, I get you. Yeah, yeah the, the numbers are all the numbers are all factored in there. So, um, so, so I think Beth and I kind of agreed upon the next step was finding all the extraneous possible expenses and, and getting those numbers together. Is that basically what you were saying? I think it's worth putting a list out there. But to Nat's point, I think getting that organizational, some options for organizational structure is a good next step also. Um, and to Evan's point, getting the full inventory list probably is another, maybe we could test. People what should we talk about next So I'll just add um, that you know, there is a statute that guides how a merger would happen, and it includes that you have to have a merger plan. Um, and the statute clearly defines what needs to be in the merger plan. And it's a lot of what Nat and you were talking about, um, the finances and organization and structure and functions of what this merged municipality is. Um, so I'll, I'll forward you all the, the link. Um, you know, if, if the intent ultimately gets to, to proceeding towards an actual formal merger, this is the sort of statute that would guide that process. Um, and we'll sort of lay out what that merger plan would need to include. And when I was speaking earlier, I, you know, I think that might be something potentially where we would have some outside help that there would be some costs associated with that. Okay. So, so I mean, the merger plan, the pricing for that is one of the things that you're waiting on information on, right? Yeah. Trying to understand, um, you know, if a formal merger didn't happen, like um, Eric was saying, perhaps Waterbury did not go through developing a formal merger plan. Um, but I'd like to speak to you know Northfield uh, and see how they handled developing that merger plan. Was that something that they just did completely in house, or did they have an outside party help them? And if they did, how much that cost, and you know what did that process look like? Um, so I'm hoping to get some more information on that. Um, but like I said, I'll I'll send out that link to the the statute that. At least we'll give you a sense of what that would need to include. Um, Kyle, I, I recognize you've been raising your hand. Unless there's objections from the select board or the trustees, I would recommend that, uh, as this is only a discussion time, we'd hold a public comment until later at the end. Yep. <laughs> um, the, uh, Eric, we laid out a whole bunch of options to like, I feel like we should have a place where just putting all this stuff and at this point, it's not formal. We're certainly not lawyers. <laughs> we may pretend to be everyone wants to go out, but we're not. Um, but we should put like have a place we can put stuff or maybe centralize it through Meredith and Brian. Um, but you can put it somewhere. Sure. Uh, because there's a lot of different topics we're talking about. We can, I'm not sure exactly where we'll put it. We'll figure out something on the website where we can put something in the repository or documents produced by the merger committee or merger subcommittee. And I'd still like to see the numbers of, or the information on do we or do we not lose the pilot money? Um, Get some real numbers on uh, attorney fees for the charter changes and that. Yeah. Uh, some real numbers that some of the communities would know. Yeah. Yep. Would we be able to call that 
the person that we're considering doing it, asking him, kind of tell him our situation and kind of have him give us an estimate, would that be? We could talk to, uh, maybe talk to, you know, Kent Gardner from CPR who produced the other report, but we don't have anybody lined up. We don't have somebody picked out. Because I was thinking, Different different communities are going to be in a different situation. Where if we go to somebody that we may use and give them our scenario, they may have a better idea what they would charge us. Yeah, uh, that's what I mean. We could we ask somebody okay. to do that. But the, what we saw when we made the request is the prices get very yeah wildly. Yeah. So it is. So we want to wait for information to actually become available, or you want to try instead of being a whole information available. Do we have any thoughts how long it would take to get some more information? Four or five years, probably. March, 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 second, March second. <laughs> So that is for March 18th. Um, um, I guess the if anyone, I guess I'll just volunteer myself. If anyone has specific cost information that you want us to be considering the, in, in the compilation, send them my way. I'll compile feedback, including people who are not part of the board. Anyone listening? <laughs> Fully. <laughs> so what? Uh, so. Um. Anyway, for the numbers specifically, I'll take that. And then, then for like subcommittee, I think subcommittee was specifically around financial subcommittee. Are we modifying it to more than financial subcommittee? And are the subcommittee board members interested in that? Well, everybody talks about the finance the whole time. Yep. Yeah. I would say that if boards can decide on costs and, and whatever, the committee can do cost analysis. Again, I mean, if they want us to research and make a list of properties or something, we could, but that should be known. I think, I think you're right about the board. <laughs> <laughs> just barely turned it on. Like it off. But the inventory list is something I'll that can be in a meeting of both boards very quick. Well, it hasn't been in there. So, fair enough. I mean, the other reality is, is that if we, if we jump on these meetings too quickly before we have the information, it's not going to make any difference. We get a year. You know, I mean, no, I'm not saying let's do it that much now. I'm just saying that, you know, but we do it in two weeks or three weeks. It's not going to make a huge difference on the end product. I just want to, I just want to, be, I just want to have another meeting on my agenda, get here and go up. So we have more information. We'll be having another meeting. So could you give us a list of the information you'd like? Yeah, we can get that. Um, get it all together and, and give it to you is what you were, what you were seeing or probably the sound board for all that. It so. sends me all compiled. So if we're gonna just send information to Beth and then we'll send it to a meeting date. I think that we have things we can talk about in a subcommittee and we can work through them. Like I feel like we could get a start on some of these things. We can start an inventory list, just us. We can contribute we can add to it later and as we go. As information flows in, we can add to it. That doesn't mean we have a that's something the boards would like to pass. I think it, the much work that you've done already in a short amount of time, this isn't going to take you that long to do it. I mean, I can't imagine it's going to take you that For a subcommittee in the amount of work you did here, you know how long it would take for 10 of us to do that? <laughs> You'll be heard in batch for you. You're lucky. That's not even bad. <laughs> oh, we are. No <laughs> question about it. Yeah. You comment. guys are the greatest thing since color color. <laughs> to, your, to your comment, my comment about a year is that we, there's nothing that can be, you guys can't bring it to this year, but right. nope. so, so we got the year before we actually come to the voters. I'm not saying we need to take the year, I'm just saying we have that amount of time. I'm not well, saying that's Eric talked about, you know, this could be all done and it could be some kind of a special meeting this summer, for crying out loud. And, uh, Hopefully it would be nice weather and 
we could have a big deal with the town and the village together. You know, some kind of an outdoor thing or something. Uh, so we're not all confined in the gymnasium. You can turn this into a big deal or something. I believe. I mean, not just me, but. The molders task each board to discuss the merger. You've already mentioned three different outcomes. Each has their own advantage and disadvantage, right? And they're not Some all mergers. mergers. They're yes. not all mergers, but they are merging assets, which I think we all kind of agree a big pain for taxpayers is, I'm gonna word it as continuity. Um, you know, having to go one place for this, one place for that. And that would solve that problem. It's a potential. And if we don't think it qualifies, that's what the voters ask. We don't have to do it. I'm just saying a subcommittee could come up, think together, brainstorm on different ideas, just write bullet points. These are advantages of this idea. These are the disadvantages. Um, if that would be helpful for the voters. Everybody's got stuff in the brains, mm -hmm. but they would start a conversation. Sure. Um, I think that's a good idea. So you'd like to join the subcommittee? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can join the subcommittee. Next All right, ready to go. The subcommittee can't answer. Uh, can can the village utilities exist on their own without the, the general budget? I think that's got to be. Mm -hmm. You guys have to answer that. I think they already do, don't they? If the answer is no, then we have to kind of figure out why or, or how it exists, you know, absent, you know. Steve, to your point, I think uh, budget-wise, they, they are separate entities, but they're all under the umbrella of the trustees. Right. That'd be a correct assessment, Meredith? Um, yes, but the you know, employee costs are allocated amongst four departments. So, so to Nat's point, you know, if the general department went away, the ability to allocate some employee costs to the general department goes away and those costs would be shifted to the remaining, um, you know, utility departments. Uh, so it's not a terribly difficult task to run sort of rough numbers to see what the impact would be. Um, you know, similarly, though, the electric department, um, water and sewer department combined send, you know, approximately $60,000 to the general department is sort of in support that we call rent for using buildings owned by the village. So, you know, there's a potential savings there if the general department didn't exist and we didn't send that money um, over, then maybe that would help wash out the loss of being able to allocate staff costs of the general department. So I can certainly look at those numbers. It's a fair question. I think we're we're pretty close. Okay. Yeah, I mean, for, for our board, Meredith, if you could, um, run costs for the election department as a standalone um so we're not you know supplementing the the, the time they spend so we're still going to need the same amount of employees we're still going to need to pay them for 40 hours a week um but they won't be tasked with sidewalks and other and other other things so um where would that leave the election department um if you can do an analysis of that that would be very helpful for us yep i can do that yeah, along with like like you were saying that um, we pay put they put in a general fund sixty grand. If we take that back out, then we would have to redo our figures that we just did because that's a sixty grand that's going to have to come from the voters right there. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. That helps answer. I think in terms of hard numbers, uh, village tax rate is one piece of that, but also. Uh, utility rate is the other. I mean, I'm village, I want village electric. So how does that affect the electric rate? I guess that's yeah. That's what that's the reason for doing that there is because if you know because there is you know, the time allocated that they spend their forty hours here is not all paid by ratepayers. It's also paid by users of the water and sewer and the general fund. Right. Um, and we also pay for the building to the general funds. There's there's a lot of this going on. Yeah. If we're going to do a separation and try to make something stand alone, we need to separate all those things and go, is, yeah. is the electric utility going to be able to stand alone without a rate increase? And then if that 60000 coming into the village is part of the capital that 
is going, then that needs to get tr transferred over to the town when they take over. Yes. So technically, the general village owns all the buildings and land. Right. And so that's why we prices do not. That's why we lease it to them. Mm -hmm. yep. so. And so, you know, not to confuse matters, but layer on top of this the village garage dis discussion and you know if it becomes clear that we're going to need to construct something does it make more sense for the village utilities to own its own building and put that sixty thousand dollars a year in a mortgage payment on a brand new building rather right. than you know putting it towards so there's a lot of ways it could be worked out um financially yeah electric department can subsidize other departments <laughs> they kind of do it in some respects. Some, well, yeah, some respect, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we're sort of wrapping up. So, like Joanne, I enjoy the subcommittee for the. She can. She can. She can. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I think it, it, the board's okay with it. Maybe recognize some public input at this point. Yeah. So the card numbers are one thing. The projected numbers for future costs is another thing. Um, <clears throat> and it's going to tickle. Um, the thing that I hear a lot and think about a lot is the sort of intangible things that the impact that it has um, having two boards and two municipalities have on the public, on volunteers, on, you know, um, and, and it's, it can feel very, yeah, painful and challenging and hard. And, um, and I think that's something, those types of things are things that we should also take a bit of an inventory on. Like, what is the impact that um, two boards versus potentially one board has on the public that, you know, live and participate in this town? And that's, it's, it's huge, it's huge. And you can't put necessarily a number value on it, but I think our volunteers, I think our, you know, our board members, you know, staff, I mean, this is all, this, this does have value and weight that needs to be part of this equation. So um, I would add an inventory of those types of things onto the other inventories we've taken. And, um, I think it's really, really important. I know that's what I hear from yes. quite a few people yes. is that whole scenario of having to go to both boards. But that's what we talked about the last during the meeting. If we come down to not merging, we could between two boards figure all that out to where it could just be one board like we did with racial justice. So I mean that's just something that we can work on with the board without even the merge. It's but you know, even with the grant, you know, we have to go to the select board to get the whole grant started and then we have to get you guys or us actually sure. to put our name on it. it it just would make things a lot easier for yeah. many things and i think to your point maybe uh if nothing else what sort of came out of that consultant's report for me anyways is there was nothing in there that indicated a huge reason why we should merge or a huge reason why it wouldn't make sense. And yet the voters overwhelmingly on both the town and village directed these boards to continue the discussion. So I think it's those intangible things is what's driving the most. And that's what yes. we're doing. And, and that was one of his conclusions too. He was like, okay, maybe financially, you know, that's one thing, but but really for the morale of the town, he felt that that was very palpable. It was like, my gosh, you know, all this squabbling and you know division and you know, the village versus the town, and da, da, da. I mean, that's just that's just bananas. 
And I think we're all sick of it. Yeah. Go ahead. We'd be interested to go back for some period of years and just do having to do that inventory you you know, find out well what people actually did have to go to town and village in order to get something accomplished. Um, whether it's a you know a, an ice rink or a sewer extension or you know a crosswalk or whatever. What what were those points of contact that the public had that they have to deal with both entities? Just to list them and say, well, this is what, what they are. So if we if we go merger route, then that's one way to deal with it. Or you go to a, a, is it possible to deal with the German rate of understanding and what would that number of understanding look like? It helps inform that to see what were the actual scenarios that people had to do that. Um, one point uh, on your former topic as well, I think they did mention volunteer fatigue in the report. Um, and I think a lot of people in town uh, have this image of you know, massively duplicated services that just isn't true. Uh, and I believe that the majority of people think it will take one. Yeah. I do believe that it is the town selectors job to at least make them aware of cost implications on a yearly basis at some point. I think it depends on who you talk to personally. It does. Um, it depends on who you talk to, and I think that people value different things. And anyone who's highly involved in any um, my brain just shut down. Anyone who's highly involved in in, um, in any committee or volunteerism in the town and is heavily involved in any of that stuff. Um, I think we do run into it quite often, like just listening to everybody talk. I feel like we should have, to your point, like the user stories and the personas. Like if I'm a, a rec member and I want to use, I don't know, the village green and legion field for some event that crosses through the village, like what does that mean and do I have to push it? If I need to work with CJ Manchester <laughs> on water, issues and drainage what does that mean what is, you know what is cj's experience yeah um and then for our employees what are their experience i just feel like there's lots of different personas we could build out in representing some of this and i think that stuff's a little bit harder and time consuming to be completely honest with you and i think there's a lot of work still to do and getting all this out and the things we need to touch on is really important and then start going through one and one, one by one. And we can't do everything all at once. We can do one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And what is that one? Thing? What's the easy win first? Oh. That's why you're a good chair. I'm um, not sure. Kevin is. Well, it's actually work. Well, they made a huge mistake. No, I can't read it wrong. <laughs> She's the one. That I nominated it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that could go to both sides too, as far as you know, if, if a merger is not voted upon by both town and village, then is there another way to solve these problems? Sure. Yeah. You know, so I think I think knowing what the issues are, where the point of contacts, you know, maybe it's a maybe it's a give and take. You know, this issue here, obviously, there's been you know 12 cases of this. You know, the easier if you take it or we take it and take all the ultimate decision of how things move. Um, I think that could, you know, better our town and village, hundred percent. I know when I moved into this place before I became a trustee, um, when I heard about the merger, the main thing I always heard was uh, townspeople are getting double taxed, and the merger will save money. But I didn't know all this stuff. That, that's why when we started talking about it, I was like, it was totally opposite than what I heard. So, well, the village people would be getting double taxed. Right, but it was the town that I heard was the one that were double taxed. You know, we almost go back to the voters just to give us a challenge. It would have been interesting to see what the mix of the voters were at town meeting versus townspeople or village people. Because really, the village people had the most to gain by this. And 
you know, when you look between uh, two to three hundred dollars more every year that the townsperson is going to have to ask, and the majority of the townspeople don't have any dealing most of the time with anything in the village, and they like things just the way they are. I cannot believe anybody's going to vote and pay three hundred dollars plus every year for taxes if they live in town. No, I think that's what Evan has uh, coming to the, with the figures and then saying eight percent, eleven percent, or whatever it ends up being. Well, where they see it will make a world of difference. I, I still think the village should be on the winning end of it, and specifically financially, when, even once we get the final numbers and stuff like that. And if we can separate it, separate the utilities, um, so they're not just they don't make sure about you know non users being controlled from their rates. I, I, I think that's going to be uh, the village will want it. I think the, I think the village, if, if you don't separate utilities, I think that would be a bonus potential for some people, but it sounds like you're heading down that route. Count. Count more. So, so do we decide on another meeting or are we going to wait to get information? The subcommittee is going to meet first and get back to us. Right up my alley. We haven't officially been tasked with anything, so we can meet and have coffee <laughs> and bring you back some coffee. <laughs> oh, I, I think it's going to be a list of long as it's green, a list of uh, <laughs> there are financial <laughs> components of the, the, the actual merger. And then, I'm not like, but, it, no, no, but sure, you're, you're being tasked with collecting it. Then, once you've collected that, then set a meeting, set so, a meeting with the committee. Sure. And that, I guess collecting that, Meredith's already volunteered to get all that information. Well, it's some like it's some of the other stuff, too. But if there's anything else yeah. we think of that wasn't already touched upon, then we can email Beth and Beth. Like all the information. I mean, all the information I've got so far that has been tasked with um, that, sorry, about um, Meredith. In my opinion, most of the rest of this isn't going to be hard specific numbers like we have now. It's right. all going to be ranges and people that can't really tell us until the actual merger happens and stuff like that. So it's going to become it's not going to become not cut and dried like it is now. People are going to have to uh, do some of this just on an act of faith, yeah. is my opinion. I agree. Yeah. All right. Do you guys think this value? Sure. Uh, we'll make a decision. And... Don't you think we'd be ready for something like that? What do you have about that? Well, we don't wait to mark Yeah, we want to see these get too spaced again. Oh, it's only a month away. Right and the commission now do it. Like one of us can do it. No. He just can't respond. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, Brian Meredith and the chair with findings from the <laughs> You guys do as good a job as you do. This yeah, time. thank you so much. I think the town should get reimbursed for a lot of work that was done. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were getting coffee. Huh? I thought you were getting coffee for that. No, the town. You only get paid for over a year. All right, I'll take a motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So, it was adjourned at uh, 739. Good night, everyone. Good night. Nice to see you. Nice to see you.